Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Mark Rudolph, Sound's Chief Experience Officer. Thank you very much for joining us on this week's COVID-19 clinical webinar. As always, we do intend to have some Q&A at the end of the presentation, and your questions also do drive the content. So please type any questions in the chat box at the bottom of the control panel at any time during the presentation. We are recording this webinar, and we will send around uh, an email with a link to the recording as well as any resources that are mentioned. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. John Berkmeyer, Sounds Chief Clinical Officer, to share a few thoughts before we begin. John? Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. This is John Berkmeyer. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Sound. Uh, thank you to um, um, thank you for joining us for today's um, um, clinical webinar uh, for COVID-19. Uh, today, you're going to hear from um, Greg Johnson, the Chief Medical Officer for Hospital Medicine, who will give you an update on um, admission trends and other um, hot off the press information from within um, Sound's organization. Uh, Dr. Sergio Zanotti, our Chief Medical Officer for Sound Critical Care, is going to share some really um, um, interesting um, um, new scientific studies that um, you know advance our clinical understanding of COVID-19 and um, how that interfaces with clinical therapeutics. And then uh, finally, uh, Dr. Nate Bruck, our CMO for Emergency Medicine, is um, is going to share new um, new data and guidance about a really hot um, and um, increasingly important topic, and that is antibody testing after COVID infection. So uh, guys, uh, thank you and take it from here. Thanks, John. Um, this is Greg Johnson, uh, the Chief Medical Officer for Hospital Medicine for Sound. Just um, going over the agenda, which should be pretty familiar to you folks um, by now, we'll uh, again provide the clinical update, um, some guidance uh, that's going on as well as the antibody testing, and then as Mark had mentioned, the Q&A. With respect to the sound update, um, we the first update is just reminding you of our uh, collective thanks across the organization for the outstanding work that everyone is doing. Um, uh, you know, we have sites like uh, our program in NIAC, which is in the heart of New York, um, where they've now had 270 um, discharges, but, um, you know, similar to, to NIAC, everybody has done uh, a collectively outstanding effort in terms of caring for patients, making sure that our hospitals are functioning adequately, and just doing a remarkable job in terms of uh, managing um, the uncertainty and anxiety that's uh, gone on in treating this uh, condition um, and responding in uh, the best way of our core values. Um, we want to follow up in terms of providing additional visibility. And as John mentioned, uh, hot off the presses, we do have um, this data that is in sound metrics. I was actually very pleased to see that a number of sites are actually using this um, to help uh, provide visibility um, for their individual programs, as well as regional medical directors in terms of providing guidance on um, <clears throat> how things are going with respect to the treatment of COVID. As you can see, we've got uh, the blue line at the top are the total of it, total admissions. Um, the screen admissions uh, is what follows. You can see the trend line moving down over the course of this past week. Um, still a significant number of, uh, of um, suspected cases and then the confirmed cases um, there is flat for the first time in a while. Uh, I think um, this, you know, again provides some visibility is the fact that um, for the programs that were most hit, you know, we're, we're starting to see um, a little bit uh, of flattening of the, the data and the number of patients that are coming through. Uh, obviously, we're using this data as well as some other predictive models to help us to understand what to anticipate for um, individual programs. Next slide, please. Um, Again, just getting a sense of the total admission trends, the yellow line being uh, the active patients, again, within the hospital medicine and critical care programs, as well as new uh, admissions. Again, the new admissions seems to have uh, tailed off, um, but uh, doesn't mean that we still aren't vigilant in terms of making sure that our, our programs are, um, have uh, adequate um, supplies in order to care for these patients. 
Finally, the same data that uh, we shared last week, um, not the same data, but the same look at the data um, with respect to just the cases by age group. And again, I think uh, what we're seeing here uh, pretty consistently, and again, this is based off of the data that our critical care and hospital medicine teams are entering into Sound Connect, um, helps to provide um, uh, additional data points um, that we use both internally and are sharing externally. Um, but as you can see, um, the confirmed, you know, broad spectrum of uh, um, different age groups uh, in terms of confirmed cases uh, and then higher mortality in the age groups, uh, in the uh, older age groups, um, that is pretty, pretty consistent with the national uh, epidemiolo epidemiologic data that um, we've seen in a number of studies. Um, so, uh, again, appreciate everybody's information, but this also provides some very specific um, information to you about um, what we're seeing, whether or not it's consistent with um, national data. Um, and I think that uh, also helps to guide some of our thinking as we uh, continue to discuss um, treatment modalities and different uh, clinical considerations. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Sergio, um, who will provide some of the clinical guidance. Thanks, Greg. Again, wanna reiterate, uh, our appreciation for all the hard work our teams are doing. Um, no matter where you are, um, what you're living is probably unprecedented in terms of our professional careers. And I do believe that uh, everybody has really risen to the occasion and made, made us very proud, but more importantly, I think, created real value and made a difference at your communities in caring for these patients with COVID-19 and also those who have to be in the hospital in these times that do not have COVID. So as mentioned earlier, I'm gonna talk about some clinical guidance or some areas that I think uh, we can update. I'm gonna talk uh, mostly about some pathophysiology and potential therapeutic implications as we see more and more cases uh, and gain experience, but also other people think about this disease. There are some, I think, very interesting observations. I'm gonna make some very brief comments on specific therapies for COVID-19 and mostly direct uh, our uh, physicians and APPs to some good resources so they can, I think, read a little bit more about this if they're interested. And finally, just to share with you very, again, briefly, some American Heart Association um, interim guidelines for CPR and ACLS and patients with COVID-19, which again, I think that for a lot of our clinicians obviously would be of, of great interest. So let's start with uh, talking about um, how our understanding of this disease is evolving in terms of the lung itself. I think a lot of you have heard this whole concept of uh, protecting the, 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 the lungs from further damage when we put them on mechanical ventilation, especially when they have ARDS. And for many years, we've operated under this concept of ventilator-induced lung injury. And the idea really being that if you were to apply very large tidal volumes, as you can see on the, on the left side of the screen, with very little end expiratory pre pressure or PEEP, what you could do is over distend alveoli and inspiration and collapse alveoli during expiration. And that is reflected in the tidal and the volume pressure curve in, in that first inflection point. So if you are doing this consistently in an injured lung with ARDS, what we found after many trials is that you were probably causing more damage and worse outcomes with the ventilator. And that's where several randomized studies were done and they proposed this concept of lung protective ventilation which on large populations basically has come to mean that we use a smaller tidal volume to avoid that over distension and that we use PEEP to try to prevent that alveolar collapse. And that is what we've been talking about for several years. And that is what everybody, when COVID started was saying, well, this looks like ARDS, we should treat it like, like ARDS. So moving forward with this whole concept of ventilation and how it can injure the lungs, just to review very basically, um, there are two ways in which mechanical ventilation or ventilation itself without spontaneously with other, with other um, support apparatus can cause negative impact on patients. On one hand, you have big swings in the pleural pressure that can be positive or negative. And those big, big swings with the pleural pressure can cause edema if they're very negative. And some of you might have seen what we call negative pressure pulmonary edema. A lot of times 
people who have healthy lungs otherwise, if they have severe laryngeal spasm after elective surgery when they're extubated, can have this injury that we see as pulmonary edema that's caused to the big swing in the negative pleural pressure. We can also apply positive pressure through a ventilator and produce big swings in the positive direction. And that usually is associated with hemodynamic problems. Uh, that's why when you give somebody a lot of PEEP, sometimes you might see drops in their blood pressure because you drop their venous return, you drop their cardiac output, and then you can cause hypoperfusion. On the other side, you might also have changes in the positive pressure and what we call the transpleural pressure. And when the transpleural pressure is increased significantly, you can again injure the lungs and produce edema. There's increased inflammation, and there's all sorts of damage at multiple levels in the lung that perpetuate that inflammatory response that we now describe as a, sim as a syndrome being ARDS. So these are the two basic mechanisms by which the lung can be injured with the application of either mechanical ventilation or even, as we'll see, in other situations. There's also lung-related causes of ventilator-induced lung injury in terms that not all lungs are probably equally susceptible to the damage that we produce with a ventilator. And this is a typical picture of a patient with ARDS, a CT scan. And what you can see is that the, the lungs look different and there's different types of alveoli. There are what we call the baby lungs, which are the small part up there in black. That's presumably more normal lung. And then you have lung that is semi-collapsed, and then you have lung that is totally collapsed. So there's really three stages. There's, there's lung that maybe if we apply volume or pressure might be over distended. That's the normal or baby lung. There is lung that as we apply volume and pressure might be recruited, which means that it's partially closed now, it opens. And then there might be lung that is unrecruitable no matter what we do. And those things also impact how the lung might be injured by mechanical ventilation. And the three things that we think about in critical care are the size of the baby lung, which is the normal, presumably more no normal lung that is left over. And that's where lowering the tidal volume protects that. We think of the amount of alveoli or parenchyma that can be recruited and that's what we usually will try to get more with higher peeps. And then there's the extent, the, ex the, the extent of how much of the lung is in homogeneous in terms of the distribution. And that is something that we have tried to address with proning. By proning patients, you redistribute both volume and pressure. And in theory, you can improve the homogeneity of the lung and the distribution. So those are the the findings in the lung that have led us to, to apply what we called lung protective ventilation. To move fo forward, we have traditionally thought about barotrauma as the type of trauma that is produced in the lung when we have very high pressures. And that is usually measured in mechanical ventilation or we try to avoid that by keeping the plateau pressure below 30. And you've probably seen that in a lot of the recommendations. And you also have what we call the volume trauma, which is the trauma that is produced by an over distension by a high tidal volume. And we have tried to decrease that by using a lower tidal volume, and that's where the six mLs per kilogram comes. Now, as we evolved over the last several years, people are recognizing that even though targeting a lung protective strategy that both reduces the amount of barotrauma trauma and volume trauma in large populations seems to make a difference in terms of mortality, there might be other ways of thinking about this that are more personalized. And a lot of experts, I'm not gonna go into much detail, now talk about stress on the lung instead of barotrauma, trauma, which is basically the amount of changes in the transpulmonary pressure, like I said earlier. And they talk about strain, which is the changes that we have in volume in relation to the functional residual capacity. Now measuring these at the bedside is, requires esophageal pressures and things that we're not doing routinely and even less we're going to be doing in a time like COVID. But I think that just to introduce these topics, I think it's valuable because at the end, what we're trying to do is recognize what's in front of us for each patient and try to apply a mechanical ventilation support that first does not produce more damage and then obviously helps the patient in the way we understand it. Now, a very important concept that has evolved over the last several years is this whole idea of patient self-inflicted lung injury 
And what you'll see is that this is very important because it's something that a lot of people are observing in COVID that people are misunderstanding. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. But the whole idea is that if you have somebody, for example, who is has any type of lung injury, has capillary leak, has lung edema, has impaired gas exchange, what usually happens is that patient will have an increased respiratory drive. And that increased respiratory drive can be potentiated by the use of BiPAP, for example, that can, that can cause very dramatic changes in the alveolar and the, the, uh, the pleural pressure, very significant increases in tidal volume that can lead to increased increase strain or increased volume trauma, and also important swings in transpulmonary pressures that can also lead to increased barotrauma. So you can actually potentiate lung injury by these mechanisms, even in patients who are not intubated. And this is something that's gonna be very important because it's something that we think might be applicable not only to ARDS in general, but also to these patients that we're seeing with COVID-19. So the, 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 what I'm trying to tell you is that ultimately, the damage that is produced by these changes either in pleural pressure or in transpulmonary pressures, right, or volume can occur with a mechanical ventilator, which is much easier to cause harm, or with other modalities of support as well. And our job is to first try to decrease that amount of injury and protect the patient from further lung damage till their, their, their disease gets better. So let's talk about COVID now. What is happening in COVID? So this is uh, from the first CT, uh, CT series or imaging series that was published with COVID-19. It's from a large group of patients in, from a group of patients in China, 83 patients in Lancet. And what you can see is that this is one patient who has CT scans on day five, day 15, and day 20. And what you might observe is that there's an evolution here from initially on day five, very minimal disease observable on the CT scan other than some grand glass opacities, mostly in the subplural space. By day 15, we can see more consolidation than a much more dense pattern of grand glass opacities that's diffusely now on both lungs and goes beyond the subplural space. And then by day 20, we see dense consolidation, some fluid, and what we see is what looks more classically like what we would think about in terms of ARDS, and looks like that first, or more like a, that first CT scan that I showed you with the three types of alveoli. So clearly, the way the lungs look on the CT scan on day five is very different than the way they look later on. And this is something that people started observing, and uh, specifically, uh, Dr. Gattinoni, who was a guest on our podcast uh, last week, uh, pointed out in some publications with some additional information that was gathered from series around the world, principally from, from Italy. And what he described was almost like two different phenotypes. And uh, the first phenotype, which corresponds to what we see on day five, is a lung that has very little in terms of infiltrates, has what we called a low elastance, which means that the lung is very compliant which means that for a given volume, it distends appropriately without increasing, without increasing pressure, has very low levels of oxygen. So, the, so, so very, I mean, very hypoxemic and with not a lot of uh, infiltrates, that makes you think that it has to do with VQ mismatch, meaning that there's probably impaired basal constriction in hypoxic areas. There might be some microthrombi, but it's something that is very clear. And then when you look at the weight of the lung and on the right side, you have basically Hounsfeld units from the CT scan and you see that most of the lung is aerated. So you can calculate the weight from that. It's very blue, uh, very tilted towards the left, very low weight or normal weight. And finally, because there's not a lot of those collapsed alveoli, if you apply PEEP, you're not gonna be able to recruit more, more alveoli because they're all open. So that is what he calls an L phenotype which is very early in the disease, and that might be different than what we usually see with ARDS. So why is this important? Because when we see patients with severe ARDS traditionally, one of the features of those patients is that they have very, very um, low oxygen, such as these. They have very high elastins, which means that they're not very compliant. Uh, 
And that forces you to use lower tidal volumes to keep the pressures down, but also forces you to maybe use higher peeps to try to open up that lung. Now, what, and we'll see how this might apply to, to treatment in a second, but the other phenotype that he described is what he calls the H phenotype. Now you have high elastins, which means that your compliance is very low. So if you look at the changes in volume and pressure with a given tidal volume, it's, it's, it's a much more uh, uncompliant lung. So the pressures go up very quickly with small volumes. You now have more right to left shunt, which means that you're seeing blood flow at places where there's no gas exchange. And that might be in the bases where it's very dense. When you measure the weight of this lung based on CT house, uh, Hausfeld units, it's very tilted to the right, which is collapsed as opposed to open lung. And these lungs actually are very heavy. They have edema and they're very heavy because of all this consolidation. And because you have all these collapsed alveoli, these lungs are much more likely to be recruitable, which means that if you apply additional pressure, you might open up alveoli that before were closed. Now this behaves a lot more like ARDS. You apply a normal tidal volume and your plateau pressures are very high, so you have to go down. You apply PEEP and your oxygenation and recruitability goes up and it really look, looks much more like, like ARDS. So recognizing this, I think has really um, brought up, I mean, how should we really think about these patients and how should we treat them? So let's, let's walk through this and think about how we can apply these concepts to COVID patients and how this might be useful at the bedside. This is a summary of recommendations for management of hypoxic patients with COVID-19. It's a chart taken out of the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine Surviving Sepsis Campaigns. And as you can see, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are in green, which means everybody agrees we should do it. There's a lot of things that are in yellow, which means we don't know, but you should consider, and I'll talk about that. And then there's a couple of things in red, which basically says do not do, everybody agrees that we should not do those things. But let's walk through this and see how we can apply these concepts of protecting the lung, patient spontaneous induced lung injury, and these phenotypes to COVID-19 patients. So the first question is, you see somebody who's very hypoxic is, does this patient have indications for endotracheal intubation? There are patients who we look at and we recognize need to be intubated. So in those cases, I think everybody agrees those patients should be intubated. You do the endotracheal intubation. The most expert person available does the airway. You have proper PPE, which includes a 95 or similar mask, and you minimize the number of people in the room. Now, what people recommend that you consider, if available, is the use of video laryngoscopy. If you don't have video laryngoscopy, or if you're not familiar with using video laryngoscopy, probably it's not recommended that you try it for the first time on a COVID patient. However, the rationale behind the video laryngoscopy is twofold. One is that it might, uh, we believe that it will improve the, the chances of success on first pass, so minimize the time of intubation. And number two, it might be a way of distancing the operator from the airway and might uh, help mitigate or decrease the risk of infection. Now, if your patient does not require endocrine intubation, we should put them on oxygen if they're hypoxic. If they're tolerating supplemental oxygen, what we should do is monitor these patients closely. We should target the saturations of oxygen above 90%, so 90 to 96%. And we should, again, put those patients in the appropriate setting and use the proper, appropriate PPE. So nobody really believes that that shouldn't be done. Now, what has been, I think, mis maybe misunderstood or I think taken in different directions is when we talk about early intubation, what people are trying to, 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 to express is that we should have a low threshold to intubate these patients if they're getting worse for many reasons, but that does not equate to intubating everybody prophylactically. And what we've learned is that we shouldn't delay intubation in these patients, but we also have learned that not everybody who gets a little bit worse on nasal cannula might need to be intubated. And that becomes very important in places like NIAC, 
where at one point they had over 50 patients on mechanical ventilation, if you can avoid intubating somebody and get them through without intubating them, from a resource standpoint, obviously it does make a difference, but making that choice is not always easy. So what do we think about or how can we apply these things further? So if they're not tolerating, if they're not tolerating um, the supplemental oxygen, let's say you keep going up and then now they need more oxygen, you, you should consider an alternative mode of support. And in general, the two things that people have offered are high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is BiPAP or and sometimes CPAP. Now, from a respiratory risk of aerosol dissemination, these might be at increased risk than a closed circuit. And that was also, I think at the beginning, a consideration a lot of people had in mind. And some of these patients might need to be kept if possible with tighter um, infection control settings. And in some settings that might be impossible. But I think that what most people have now thought or, or believe is that high flow nasal cannula probably would be a better option as a first to go option. In some instances, you might still have to use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or BiPAP. But in both cases, what is most important, and I think is what's most misunderstood, is that if these patients on an escalated support are still having issues in terms of retractions, increased work of breathing, and that can be a surrogate for seeing these big swings in pleural pressure, big changes in transponary pressure, larger than needed tidal volumes, they are probably injuring their lungs further. And these are the patients that eventually when they get intubated, probably have a worst outcome. So if you choose to use one of these modalities, either high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, in addition to the proper infection control, you need to be very, very vigilant and make sure that they are getting better quick because if they're not getting better quick, you might be exacerbating the damage based on those things that we talked before. And those are the patients that more and more we believe should be intubated earlier in order to take control of the ventilation and decrease the amount of injury that we produce to them. So that's just a walkthrough all these, these, uh, 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 this algorithm using what we shared before as a background to understanding what's going on. Let's talk a little bit more about this. So from respiratory support standpoint, which is the main way of therapy for these patients, I think about it in three buckets. Most patients that we're gonna see got admitted because they at least need oxygen. So you start them on oxygen and you try to keep their SATs above 90. And once they get to six liters per minute or going higher, you might have to start thinking that they might need escalation. One of the big questions about these patients is, should we put them on their bellies or in prone position? Clearly prone position works for ARDS and would definitely use it in patients who are intubated. But I also think that there's a growing um, trend to also suggest to patients who are breathing spontaneously to try to lay on their belly and you can check their pulse socks. Some people get ABGs, but I don't know, you can do that if you have a lot of patients. But you can also ask the patient, in which position are you better? And a lot of people without, I mean, any formal studies, but based on improving physiology and recognizing that the oxygenation gets better, have found that if we can keep these patients on their belly for extended periods of time, either having them sleep overnight on their bellies or stay on their bellies most of the day when they're awake, we can actually improve the oxygenation at least in a demonstrable way. And that might be something that helps them preventing from going up. Now, the way I think about self-proning patients or proning patients on the floors, uh, I would do it, ask the patient if they feel better, keep them there and they can tolerate it. If they feel worse, maybe not worth um, pushing, but the dangers are truly minimal. And I think that there's potential plausibility for benefits and people have seen benefits, at least from the oxygenation standpoint. If with those interventions, they're still getting worse, you start thinking of escalation. Some patients may, may be at a point where they just think that they need to be intubated and they go to mechanical ventilation. But I do think that it's also reasonable to try high flow nasal cannula first, or in some instances, BiPAP, with the caveat that you need very close monitoring. And if these patients can turn around very quickly and you evaluate them and they look comfortable and they're not having 
uh, an increased work of breathing and they're actually improving, you might be able to avoid intubating. But if they're not improving or getting worse, I think that the biggest danger for these patients is to keep them on those modalities for prolonged periods of time and then eventually intubating them. And probably what we have achieved at that point is a significant amount of damage to the lungs that will ultimately make their course more difficult. As we escalate or as people are requiring more oxygen, I think it's very important for our ICU teams to be in touch with our, with our hospitalist teams to make sure that we have that communication. And that applies from the ED to the floors, from the ED to the ICU, from the floors to the ICU, vice versa, and really making sure that you're having that communication, that these are patients that are getting worse to try to make sure that we are acting early on these patients when they don't respond to escalation therapies. Finally, if we intubate a patient, I think that it would be worthwhile thinking about where we stand in the disease. Now, I'm not proposing that we get CT scans on everybody. If you had a CT scan, you could use it, but I wouldn't get it if you don't have it. But the idea is that if you intubate somebody and they're early on in their course, as soon as you intubate them as a clinician, you can put them on, the recommendation is to use low tidal volumes, which goes from four to eight. Early on, if, if you think that they might have an L phenotype, you can go with six or eight, see how they do, check their lung compliance, check their plateau pressures. And what we have observed treating these patients that, that usually these patients early on have a very low compliance. So their plateau pressures are very low. So you can maybe use a higher tidal volume, the range of eight, which is still considered within the low tidal volumes, but you don't have to go all the way to six or four, check their compliance, keep their plateau pressures below 30. And then these patients probably do benefit from PEEP, but they benefit from PEEP not because you're recruiting alveoli, they benefit from PEEP because you are op because you are redistributing blood. So a PEEP of eight to 10 is probably all you would need in these patients. Uh, if you have to go higher, you can try it, but, but most people now believe that in these patients with early COVID, L phenotype, lungs that don't look with a lot of infiltrates, normal compliance, if you start going up on the PEEP, all you're gonna get is no improvement in oxygenation and you're gonna see the hemodynamic consequences. So probably no worth, it's not worth doing that. Prone position also works in these patients and if they're very hypoxic, putting them on their belly for prolonged periods of times has improved. And again, it might be a redistribution of the blood, but clearly I think that every European country, the Chinese and what we've seen in the United States so far have pushed to prone these patients early when they're hypoxic and usually they will require longer prone, prone cycles than what we see with our ARDS patients. As the patient progresses, and we don't know if these patients progress from the L phenotype to the H phenotype because of the virus, because of what we did or didn't do to them, but a lot of patients do progress. And what you'll see is that your compliance will start going down. If you have imaging, you'll see more infiltrates. And in these patients, you might move further towards more of a traditional ARDS um, uh, ventilation with even lower tidal volumes targeting the plateau pressures. And in these patients may be going higher on the PEEP to try to recruit those, those lungs. But as well, these patients also benefit from prone positioning and maybe with a little bit of a different pathophysiology and what prone does to them. But again, I think I would treat those patients like you would treat most of our severe ARDS patients today. So, a lot of the recommendations remain the same, but I think that part of the challenge has been that people really are looking for dichotomies, like early intubation, intubate everybody, uh, use four of tidal volume, put it to everybody. And I think that even though we're seeing very large number of patients, we still have to try to understand what's going on with each individual patient. And within these recommendations, try to titrate the therapy that best matches what we think is going on. The second thing I want to talk about today is a little bit of what we're seeing in terms of autopsies. There's been, there's been a lot of reports on social media about autopsies from Italy, but there's not, not much published. But we do have published series from American hospitals. And one of the first ones that was published was from, our, from New Orleans. And uh, this is just the first four patients out of a series of, of 12. But what they found is that these patients all had uh, comorbid conditions. They all died, obviously. And they all had probably, uh, they were all intubated, all were critically ill. And at the end of, when they looked at their lungs, they had very heavy ed edematous lungs with patchy hemorrhages, which is what we 
what we think is the H phenotype. So these patients died a little bit later in their disease. They also found significant cardiomegaly in, some of the, in most of these patients with RV enlargement and with a, a basically a flattening of the interventricular septum, as you can see in that in that B figure. And then when they looked at the at the lungs and did slices, they also found microthrombi and small firm thrombi in many of the vessels. Now, when you look at the microscopy of the lung, there's diffuse cellular damage with hyaline membranes and hemorrhage. So you can see in the first slide that is typical of many forms of ARDS. They found fibrin thrombi in small vessels and capillaries, and there's a whole bunch of extracellular fibrin deposition. Now, this type of intravascular thrombosis with fibrin in the small vessels and capillaries is not unique to COVID. Uh, we see it in other forms of septic shock and other forms of ARDS. But what I do think is unique to COVID is the number of patients that we're seeing. So of course, I mean, if you see a, an influx of 2.5 million patients, there's going to be a large number of them that end up in ICUs, and they're going to exhibit some of these very severe manifestations associated with other infections. But when you put these findings in conjunction with what we're seeing elsewhere and what we're seeing with that L phenotype, pretty clear, pretty clear X-ray initially or very little infiltrate, but just severe hypoxemia, it's proposed that and knowing where the the, the, the knowing that a lot of the introduction of the, the, the virus to, to cells is through the ACE2 receptor, there's clearly a lot of thought about endothelial dysfunction, cryolopathy, uh, microthrombi, basoplegia, microcirculation abnormalities, which are all things that have been studied and described in septic shock as well. But we have never seen such a number at the same time in a short period of time of patients with a single, with a single source of infection. However, this might have some implications into what we do. So in terms of supportive interventions, I still think that these patients need prophylactic antibiotics, control the fever with, with acetaminophen. Um, I think in general, we're gonna talk more about maybe in the next webinar about corticosteroids, but in general, I think for most patients that come in with COVID, the recommendation is not to use corticosteroids. In terms of fluid management, early on, recognize that these patients have fevers, have acute kidney injury, they probably do need fluids early on. And once that's resolved or better, more of a conservative management, and once they get intubated or need escalation, I think really aiming for a negative fluid balance like we would do with other ARDS patients probably helps with oxygenation. But what I really want to talk about is this whole concept of should we be anticoagulating these patients? Now, there is physiological evidence that there might be vasoplegia and, micro and, and abnormalities in the endothelial dysfunction. There is increased reports of thrombosis in patients, even those who don't die, mac uh, macro thrombosis. And like many other forms of severe infection, there seems to be an association with not only inflammatory dysfunction, but a, a, an association with a dysregulation of our cryolopathy cascades with potential to, um, to have microclots and microthrombi. We also know that very high D-dimers are associated with worse outcome as as so other findings such as DIC. So a lot of people taking that physiologic observ and anatomical observations have suggested that we should be anticoagulating these patients. Nobody has studied that rigorously. This has been studied before in patients with septic shock. And when you look at the large studies with heparin, um, thrombomodulin, or even activated protein C, it's been very difficult to figure out exactly which are the patients who might benefit and which will not, and ultimately not something that we do routinely. However, I would say that based on what we're seeing with COVID, it does make a lot of sense to think about anticoagulation from a prophylactic and therapeutic way a little bit different um, uh, as of now. And this is one protocol that I found that's from the University of Pennsylvania, which I think is reasonable. But again, what I would say is that in general, we should be aggressively prophylaxing every single patient with COVID-19 with some form of pharmacological heparin or low, a low molecular weight heparin or a fractionated heparin. And I would add, we should have a very low threshold to fully anticoagulate them if we have evidence that substantiates potential clots. Now, let's think about this. The first thing is I think that you should think about the bleeding risk as well because 
then when you're doing this to a lot of patients, the the downside would be we start anticoagulating everybody and now we produce a whole bunch of heparin related complications. So if you suspect or have make macrothrombosis in an ICU or medical floor patient, you should treat them, period. There's no question about that. What I would say though, is that I would be more, um, more aggressive in the suspicion part. So for example, if somebody is on CRT and they clot their filter a couple of times, I would probably anticoagulate that patient, period, if they have COVID-19 immediately. If you suspect that they might have micro, a, a macro thrombosis elsewhere, as you're trying to get the test, I would start anticoagulation in those patients as well. If they have a low risk of bleeding, you could do therapeutic intensity with low molecular weight heparin or with heparin, doesn't really matter. If they're a higher risk of bleeding and you have to fully anticoagulate them, we always prefer to use unfractionated heparin because it has a shorter half-life and we can stop it if they bleed. What about if you don't suspect any form of deep thrombosis? I think that in the standard patient that's on the medical floor, at the minimum, if they have a low risk of bleeding, um, I would use a standard intensity. Uh, and if they have a high risk of bleeding, I would still consider giving them anticoagulation. So I think that the benefits probably outweigh the risk. And this is, uh, when I say anticoagulation, I'm talking about prophylactic, prophylactic doses. So we'll, 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 sh we'll share this in a second. What about if they're getting worse on the floor or on the, on the, on the ICU? Maybe you can be a little bit more aggressive in those sicker patients and use a, either intermediate intensity or a therapeutic intensity. And uh, if they have a high risk of bleeding, maybe be a little more conservative and either go from standard to high, to, to high intermediate. And in those patients that are critically ill, I think that again, I would at least, if they have low risk of bleeding, do a high end prophylaxis, or if I have any suspicion or any proof that suggests that they might be clotting, I would actually move to a therapeutic intensity. And those who are critically ill and have a high risk of bleeding, I might be a little more conservative and start with standard intensity, but I would also consider in these sick patients a more aggressive intensity, the intermediate intensity, which is a prophylactic intensity. So what do I mean by standard, intermediate, and therapeutic? So in general, if you use enoxaparin, standard intensity is just our usual prophylaxis, 40 milligrams per day. Intermediate would be 0.5 milligrams per kilogram twice a day. And therapeutic is one milligram per kilogram twice a day. For those patients who have a cranial clearance less than 30 or are renal replacement therapy, um, and you use, you're gonna use unfractionated heparin, standard intensity is 5,000 Q12 to Q8. Intermediate intensity, which is still prophylactic would be 7,500 uh, 7, Q8 which is more aggressive than we usually would do. And finally, if you're gonna do therapeutic intensity, I would go to an, a PTT goal of 60 to 85 based on a drip. So this is a little bit different than what we're saying for other patients. What we're saying is that we should aggressively prophylact these patients and using maybe higher doses than we usually do. We should look at the risk of bleeding, but we should also have a very low threshold to start these patients on full anticoagulation if we have either indications or suspicion that there might be more macrothrombosis. And I think that this is gonna be very important because um, it, we're not gonna have a, maybe as, as many CTs or ultrasounds on these patients, but I think it's a little bit different than what we've been treating other patients that usually get admitted to our services. And we'll see what the studies show and what, what else I mean we can learn, but I do think that these are two important developments that have changed a little bit the way we look at this. So. I'm gonna move forward because I don't wanna run out of time for, for, for our other discussion, but potential targets, a lot of potential targets on paper. The reality is that there are no therapies that have been shown to be effective to date. I'm gonna refer you guys to read this uh, article published last week in JAMA, phenomenal review of everything that's been studied so far and proposed in COVID. But the conclusion is no therapies have been shown effective to date. This is the IDSA recommendations, and you can read them. There's also the link there, but basically they are saying that all these drugs that people are talking about are experimental, the data is very thin, and that they really should be used in the context of clinical trials. Now, our message to our clinicians is very simple. There are some of these drugs that are being utilized. People have always had the ability to use drugs that are off-label for other indications. I do believe that for many reasons, we should be documenting what we're using and why. Uh, 
and we should be talking with families and, they, and patients and they should be aware that we're using these experimental drugs. And if you haven't documented that and used a drug, I think you can still get consent in retrospect, but I do think it's very important from an ethical standpoint that if we can't participate in a clinical trial and you decide to use one of these, that patients and families understands the risk benefits and that we document that in the chart and that we actually inform them about getting this. Finally, um, just share with you that last week, the American Heart Association uh, shared some interim guidance for uh, cardiac arrest management. Um, the link is gonna be in, in, in what we send out. I think for all of you who are involved with cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest management, I think it's gonna be a valuable just algorithm and to read. It really emphasizes on what are the things that we need to do different as a team in terms of minimizing risk in terms of uh, using proper PPE and in terms of minimizing the risk of having uh, aerosolization and prioritizing for intubation as soon as possible, as you'll see. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nate and he's gonna talk about antibody testing. Thanks, Sergio. You can go ahead to the next slide. So there's been you know, a, a huge amount of uh, noise regarding antibody testing in the lay press, and there's been, you know, some regulatory movement, and I think it, there's a lot here that's worth unpacking and giving an update on. You know, and, and just to set the stage, uh, you know, as to what impact this could have, I think it has, you know, really the the impact most germane to us is, you know, imagine how it would change the psychology of treating COVID patients if you had demonstrated immunity. You know, obviously you'd still need to utilize PPE, but your risk of bringing infection home to your family and, you know, the risk of getting ill yourself would be much lower. Also has huge implications for the research that we're doing. You know, there are some problems now in doing research in that this condition has a huge rate of spontaneous improvement, and we also don't really know the true extent of infection. And and we don't have a gold standard test for making the diagnosis. And that constellation of three things really makes creating high quality research on therapeutics challenging. So antibody testing is critical there. An important therapeutic also is convalescent plasma. It's being investigated in a number of places in both New York and the West Coast and, and actually other spots as well now. And you need ELISA antibody testing to um, utilize that therapy. I'm not sure that we're going to be having mass gatherings or uh, unrestricted international travel without some form of immunity demonstration, and I don't really see another path to that aside from, from antibody testing. So uh, go ahead to the next slide. So just to set the stage of what we're talking about, the, the testing that we've talked about previously on these webinars has been the you know, the reverse transcriptase PCR testing where you take a nasopharyngeal swab or a lower respiratory tract sample and you, you try and look for um, snippets of viral RNA by amplifying, you know, the base pairs that are, that are on the swab or in the sample. And what, this, what we're looking for here with the antibody testing is really quite different. So to just very briefly in the interest of time, walk you through it. You know, if you have a, say an alveolar macrophage that, um, you know, through phagocytosis takes in some infectious particles from, you know, SARS-CoV-2 um, cell in your lung. And, you know, that macrophage then uh, kind of chops up that foreign material and presents it to a T cell. And that, that T cell then stimulates B cells to make antibodies. Antibodies, come in several types and you know they they bind to foreign antigens and help destroy them. So this is really kind of the junction between um, you know your innate immune system and adaptive immunity which has memory and gives you the ability to rapidly fight off infections when they present again. And you know you'll see in the in the graphic here that IgM antibodies peak early in disease. They've been detected through ELISA methods, you know, as early as like day three or four in the illness. IgG peaks later, and really the, the height of that peak is not totally known for SARS-CoV-2 infection, but, you know, certainly it's weeks. And no one really knows if these, uh, the presence of these antibodies are going to be what, you know, immunologists would call neutralizing antibodies and confer immunity. We know for many infections, you know, once you develop adaptive immunity, you're 
you're not going to get the infection again. Now, if you look at what happens with viruses that cause the common cold or with influenza, you know, a lot of individuals aren't able to maintain neutralizing antibodies. So what these what this antibody testing means for COVID-19, I, I don't think we know for sure yet. I think there's reasonable empiric data to suggest that repeat infection is unusual though. So you can go to the next slide. So there's there's really two quite different pathways toward antibody testing. There's ELISA testing, which occurs in a you know high complexity lab environment with expensive equipment. It takes hours to perform. It requires phlebotomy and considerable experience. And then there are point of care tests, which rely on most of them rely on lateral flow. If you see the analyzers, they look um, you know very much like a, a point of care pregnancy test that you'd buy at a drugstore. And they can be run on a finger stick sample. They take minutes to result. They're low complexity tests, some of which are CLIA waived. There are companies already talking about shipping these directly to consumers. There's, you know, everything can be stored at room temperature. There's no instrumentation required. You don't even need a nursing level of healthcare experience to run these tests. So they're attractive in a lot of ways. Now in the next slide, we'll talk about some problems and some issues. So, well, I guess before we get to that, this is, this is what this lateral flow technique, what the analyzer looks like. And this is, you know, you could see the, the sample well where you put, um, you know, a finger stick blood sample. And then there's a control line, an IgG line, and an IgM line. And basically there are these colloidal gold nanoparticles inside that lateral flow film that create a colored reaction line in the event that the antibodies which the tests are designed around are present in the sample above the detectable level. So you, you can go to the next slide. And you know, these rapid tests sound great for all the reasons outlined on that slide. You don't need complex equipment, they're portable, you don't need, um, you know, a, a high complexity laboratory. But what's happened is that the, the FDA has opened an emergency use exemption for these tests. And basically what that pathway means is that vendors that are and labs that are making these tests can just go ahead and send them out and have them used. And the FDA says, well, you know, when you get your data, send it back to us, and then we'll decide if you need to recall your tests. And right now, today, there's about 90 vendors making these with minimal oversight. And if you look at what, um, you know, the IDSA, what the World Health Organization and others are saying about these point of care rapid tests, they're really taking a tempered approach and saying, you know, maybe these aren't quite ready for prime time yet. The, in the lay press recently, there's been a number of articles about, um, you know, antibody testing that just really turned out not to be super useful. And I think that, you know, the the other piece of information that's worth knowing is that all these tests are slightly different in terms of what part of the coronavirus they're specific to and the degree of cross reactivity with, you know, there are four coronaviruses very commonly circula circulating in the U.S. that cause, you know, a, a not insignificant fraction of common colds. And some of these tests may have um, cross reactivity with proteins that are present in those viruses. So, so really, I think the take home point is, you know, buyer beware and, and rapid tests really probably shouldn't be used outside research settings to make any meaningful decisions. Now the ELISA testing on the other hand, if you have if you're at a hospital that has, you know, a, a, a lab where they're able to pour, perform serology, you know, using the ELISA framework and they have um, you know, I, I think that has real viability. And I also think that these rapid Im immuno Im immunodiagnostic tests are going to improve pretty substantially. And I think that improvement will occur quickly. Uh, you, can, you can go to the next slide. So I threw this in there and I, I think that we what we may try and do, is, this is an Excel spreadsheet and it just points out what a, you know, let's say you have a pretty great test that's 99% sensitive and 99% specific. The prevalence of disease in your sample that you're testing has a huge influence on how useful the results are. And this is just a Excel spreadsheet you know, that automatically calculates and you can change the things that are highlighted in, in blue. And what you see here is that with a if you have 100,000 patients and you have a disease prevalence of 1% and you test everyone, look what happens with your positive tests. 
your true positives and your false positives are equal. So your positive predictive value is only 50%. And, you know, I, I think this is really useful for clinicians interpreting tests to play around with because some of the outcomes of how prevalence impacts medical testing are not super intuitive unless you really work through examples. You can go ahead to the next slide. Now, for the next part of our discussion, we're going to move on into Q&A. I think the next slide actually is a compendium of the four resources which we've been distributing, which you know really continue to be excellent. And with that, I think I'll I'll take a breath and hand off to Mark Rudolph, who will uh, MC our Q&A. Thanks very much, Nate. <clears throat> um, we have five minutes, and we have two excellent questions, and one that somebody asked me the other day that I thought would be relevant to the conversation. So let's start with the ones that were just submitted now. Um, regarding anticoagulation on COVID positive patient on discharge with a D-dimer that is, quote, stable, but 500 to 1,000 range, what are thoughts about sending them out on a prophylactic dose of Eliquis? So nobody knows. I think that most people have agreed that the D-dimer can be something that identifies high risk, but might not be the best thing to determine long-term anticoagulation. I think that that is going to have to be an individual decision. Obviously, depending on the follow-up and, and, and what are the other risk factors, but um, there's no data on this. Some people have recommended that these patients be sent for a couple of weeks, maybe on some sort of prophylaxis. But it's a great question, but I don't think that there's a definite answer. Okay. Um, same topic. What do we do with patient already on outpatient oral anticoagulation? I think that I would switch them if they're critically ill or they're very sick in the hospital to full anticoagulation with a heparin-based um, product. If it is, if they are in low risk of uh, bleeding, you could use um, low molecular weight heparin. If they're high risk of bleeding or have issues with their cranial clearance, I would use unfractionated heparin. But yeah, people who are anticoagulated pre-COVID should absolutely be anticoagulated while they're in the hospital with COVID. And then they would you would have to transition them to some form as they go home, but they would be back on their anticoagulation. Okay, great. The next question, I think probably this is in Greg's, uh, Greg's ballpark. <clears throat> I've heard a number of people talk about discharging patients back into the community and that it's you know not infrequently the case that it's not a totally straightforward discharge. In other words, the person may have a partner that is high risk um, or there are some other complicating factor related to the discharge, specifically in the setting of COVID and, and uh, potential spread of the disease. Um, Greg, any thoughts on how people are handling those situations? Yeah, um, a lot of complexity that uh, is involved in that. And I think referring back to the prior webinars, um, as well as the CDC guidelines, I, I think most of what we are looking at is um, uh, identifying processes and considerations that um, uh, we've mentioned before. The first is, you know, the, the ultimate question is, when do we discontinue, um, you know, the, the transmission-based protocols? Um, I think some of that's going to be based on availability of testing, although acknowledging what Nate shared earlier about the false negative rate, I think for the most part, people are following through with the symptom-based strategy, which is making sure that the individual is masked, um, that they're breathing normally, they're afebrile without medications, and that they are still wearing a mask and following up with um, uh, aggressive hand hygiene for a minimum of 72 hours, and then um, additional discussion with their uh, with the primary care physician um, that's in the community. I think uh, most of the recommendations that the CDC provides um, indicates that that 72 hours probably makes sense, although, you know, some people are looking at extending it up to um, seven days um, as long as the patient, again, remains asymptomatic. Um, if you have the two negative tests and the ability to get that done um, uh, in a timely manner, that may provide some additional reassurance. But, um, again, no clear guidelines, but I, I think using some of 
the guidance that um, we provided uh, before may give some indications on how to approach that. Okay, thanks. So we're just about at the top of the hour. Um, any closing thoughts? Sergio, you want to start? No, I think that, uh, again, just reiterate uh, our appreciation and admiration for all the clinicians. I think that there is an enormous amount of, uh, of inbounding information. Uh, unfortunately, not all of it the same quality. There is an abundance of opinions being published. And again, I mean, I think we don't have all the answers. I don't think that we have, we know enough about COVID to say what's really helpful, what's really hurt, what really uh, uh, harmful. But together, I think we're, we're learning and uh, trying to move forward. Uh, I hope that everybody's safe and that uh, if they have any questions, they reach out to us. Great, thanks. Greg, closing thoughts? Um, reiterating the thanks and gratitude, um, also reiterating um, our desire to uh, continue to receive these questions. I know Nate, Sergio, and I are, are getting the questions from COVID-19, as well as um, when people are reaching out individually, um, and we're either emailing or calling people back. Um, so please uh, continue those. Uh, they do guide not only these sessions, but the um, specially specific sessions. Um, but once again, thanks. Appreciate your taking the time and being here. Um, appreciate the engagement, um, but most importantly, just appreciate the excellent work that you're doing. Awesome. Nate? I would reiterate the thanks for all you do. I would remind everyone that we have PPE available if your site is challenged. Um, we have KN95 masks and also surgical masks, and there's a link where those can be requested on the Knowledge Center and your RMD can help facilitate. I would also say that, you know, we um, really want to create high quality content by us for you. And it's, you know, to do that, getting your feedback is really important. So if there's any feedback, positive, negative, or otherwise, send it our way. And thank you uh, for listening. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, don't have a cure, but a lot of great progress. Um, Send us questions, as everybody pointed out, and we will direct them to the right people. And have a great rest of your day.